Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil Colonna, and this is Nashville. As dean of Vanderbilt University's Divinity School, Emily Towns has led the institution through some radical transformations. The curriculum was expanded with a focus on social justice. The building was renovated, and the school saw an influx of diversity, reflected in faculty, staff, and students. Now Towns is stepping down from her role as dean. Later this hour, we'll meet Dean Towns and reflect on her legacy and what is around the corner. But first, it's time for Add Us. Each week, We take time to read the comments so you don't have to. Yes, I'm encouraging you to literally at us on Twitter at This Is Nashville and on Instagram at This Is Nashville underscore WPLN. Joining me now with a look back at the past week is our digital lead, Anna Geigos Cannon. Hey, Anna. Hey, Khalil. It's always good to be in the studio with you. Good to have you back. Okay, here we go. What have our listeners been talking about this past week? So last Thursday's show about artificial intelligence in music prompted a lot of listener input Mm -hmm. and a lot of differing opinions about it, too. So Parker on Twitter wrote to us saying, quote, AI is incapable of replicating the human elements that make art art, Hmm. meaning inspiration, self-discovery, process, craft and skill development that can't be squirted out by an app. By an algorithm, it seems AI will be good for giant corporations' bottom lines, but terrible for art and artists. We love Monet's water lilies because he spent innumerable hours in his garden chasing the light. Beep boop. Look, the computer made a flower picture. Just ain't the same. AI solves a problem that doesn't exist. There are millions and millions of competent human artists. Mm-hmm. End quote. I, lo- I love the sound effect, by the way. <laughs> uh, now, Clifford on Twitter had a different take. He wrote, quote, I think people who are making creative works, whatever medium, will be impacted less by AI. Commercial work might be a different story. I agree with your guests that compared AI to drum machines. Many thought drummers would be put out of work. Maybe some were, but many thrived. So after that show, our guest, Charles Alexander, weighed in on Twitter. He wrote, quote, I don't think the conversation between 100 percent organically created art and AI art is an either or. I think it can be both. What is clear is that AI brings access to folks from all walks of life, especially in music. True democratization of access to tools that create is closer to being a reality than ever before. Not only can professional producers now create, but fans, students, and anyone who has access to a laptop can do the same, end quote. Charles and Parker actually had a really good discussion in our Twitter mentions on the topic. So if anyone is, you know, interested in AI and art or AI and music, it's definitely worth checking out. Okay. Now, a few days after the AI episode, we spoke about music education, particularly the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum's Words and Music program. During that episode, we heard from Judy, who wrote us to us saying, quote, besides expression and creativity. Writing a song teaches young people the skills of synthesizing, which translate to so many different activities later on. I grew up in Switzerland where music classes were a required part of our education for that reason, end quote. Music education for the win, y'all. Yes. There are so many studies out there about the benefits of music classes for kids, everything from improved language skills to even helping their self-esteem. Now, I don't want to date myself, but back when I was in elementary school, we had music classes Five days a week. Okay. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Those were the days. All right. So during last Friday's episode about swimming, Farah asked us, quote, are there restrictions to try Lifeguard Academy, like clothing? For example, many Muslim women or girls need to dress conservatively, end quote. And Anna, you kind of dove into this. What'd you find? So Farah's question actually led me down an internet rabbit hole. The lifeguarding a manual from the American Red Cross doesn't exactly have a dress code for lifeguards, a saying, aside from saying you got to look professional. So think less Baywatch and more board shorts. Okay. But the burkini is also an option. For those who don't know, it is a full body swimsuit with a, a hooded tunic that was actually designed by an Australian woman in the early 20,000 or 
early aughts for Muslims and more conservative women who actually wanted to be lifeguards. It was literally designed to make lifeguarding more inclusive. Very nice. All right. What else do we have? So we got a tweet from Mary Rudy about last week's episode on navigating into adulthood with disabilities. She wrote, quote, this is the kind of in-depth real world, real world reporting you only get with public radio. That's right. Mary. That's right, Mary. Don't you forget it. Um, we, 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 We try to do this for everyone. We also wanted to let listeners know that that episode really had some impact. As part of it, our executive producer, Andrea Tutho, produced an audio feature about Backlight Productions, which is a local theater company that puts on a full Broadway musicals starring local adults with disabilities. Now, after our episode, the director of Backlight said she got a lot of calls from community members who heard the story and wanted to learn more and get involved. How about that? Awesome. It's always really cool to hear about when our episodes inspires people to get involved with their community. I love it. That's right. Okay, Anna, do we have anything else? Yes. One last thing that some of y'all may have caught. So yesterday, a piece of our show inadvertently played during Fresh Air. Sorry, Terry Gross. And one of our close listeners actually caught it and DM'd us on Twitter. Well, I got to say, we are really grateful for those close listeners. And of course, we're very sorry about that era. I'd like to remind people that we're human beings back here getting national and local content onto your airwaves every day. For real, y'all. I do think unfortunate errors like this do have a way of reminding people listening that it takes a lot of careful effort to broadcast our content all day, every day. Amen. And that is our digital lead, Anna Gallegos Cannon. Thank you for this roundup, Anna. Of course, and our listeners know where to find me online. All right. And don't forget to add us on Twitter and Instagram. Let's keep the comments coming. Also, fill out our community survey to let us know what topics you want us to cover at thisisnashville.org. It's super easy and very quick and helps us produce shows with your needs and interests in mind. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll sit down with renowned theologian and outgoing dean of Vanderbilt's Divinity School. Emily Towns. Join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Kaliole Colonna, and this is Nashville. For the past 10 years, theologian Emily Towns has served as dean of Vanderbilt's Divinity School. Under her leadership, the the Divinity School has grown its reputation as a leading theological institution, preparing the next generation of ministers and community leaders. Her peers recognize her as a path-breaking, innovative leader who has shaped the curriculum to respond to the changing needs of a student body that has grown more diverse over the past decade. At the end of this month, Emily Towns is stepping down as dean, and she joins us now to reflect on the past decade. Dean Towns, thank you for being here, and welcome to This is Nashville. Thank you. It's good to be here. So good to have you with us. And let me say firstly, congratulations on this next move. Ten years is a very, very long time. Yes, it is. Okay, so let's go back to your early days at Vanderbilt, or really before you got there. I'm, I'm curious, like back in the 2010s, what did you know about Vanderbilt's Divinity School? Was it on your radar? It was on my radar, but um, mostly because I knew some of the faculty members and um, didn't really know that much about the school itself. So it was a bit of a surprise when um, one of my friends, who is um, a member of the faculty, uh, mentioned to me that their dean was stepping down at the time, and would I be interested in applying for the job? And I literally cussed her out. <laughs> and it was not a happy cuss. It was a oh, no way cuss. But she persisted. My spouse persisted. And the rest is history. We'll get into that a little bit. What helped 
you to give the idea of becoming dean here? What helped you give that more consideration? There were several things, but I think the main thing for me was the fact that as I got to know the school more, reading the materials, uh, um, it says about itself, taking all of that with a grain of salt, because we always present the best case scenario of who we are, uh, I realized that we might be kindred spirits. Mm. Um, Vanderbilt's history as um, a more liberal to progressive theological voice in the South, joined only really um, by Wake Forest Divinity School in that regard, its willingness to tackle issues unapologetically um, like racism, sexism, homophobia, heterosexism, classism, all the isms, not as social statements, but as deeply theological problems, mm. really lit up for me um, as, a, as a social ethicist uh, that there's something here okay. that I need to pause and look at. I mean, by this time, you had quite the career. In your field, you were serving as Andrew W. Mellon, Professor of African American Religion and Theology and Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at Yale University. Mm -hmm. You're an ordained American Baptist clergywoman. You're a published author. I could go on, but I only have an hour for this show <laughs> to talk about all this. You know, so when you look at your history and Vanderbilt's history and you find this, this kindred nature between the two of you, when it came time for you to apply for the job, what was kind of going through your mind? Did you feel like this was meant to be? No. In fact, I didn't. I didn't really want to apply for the job. But in order to um, really appease my spouse and my friend, I said, okay, I will put together the application statement, which, by the way, takes a lot of time and energy because mm -hmm. I don't believe in doing things halfway, even if I don't really want to do it. And then I promptly forgot about it. Okay. Um, I was, uh, by that time, I was on my first sabbatical in about eight years. I'd missed a couple uh, serving as academic dean, and I was exhausted. And so I was having a grand old time uh, being a visiting professor. Hmm. at uh, Chicago Theological Seminary. And when I got the um, email that they wanted to interview me, I didn't know what it was about at first. And I had to read it a couple of times and go, oh, yeah, I did, I did sign up for that, um, not thinking that they were, would be serious. But they were. But they were. And um, subsequently you've come to Vanderbilt to be the dean. I want to hear about some of the first moves. Like, what did you do? What were your first moves when you got here as dean? Well, it was actually before I got here, I think was so important for me. Um, the faculty had um, had several years of dissension internally. Um, and I knew that was a possibility when I interviewed. Uh, it turns out not only... I asked, but the other two candidates asked, are you done fighting? And they said, mm -hmm. yes, we are. Mm -hmm. And they were serious. It was true. So that was pleasant. But what I decided to do, since I was already on um, sabbatical, I would turn my sabbatical project into learning the Divinity School okay. as a social ethicist. So I started examining it every which way but loose. Um, and I interviewed all of the staff first and had one question for them and one restraint for them. Tell me what's best about the Divinity School was the question, and the restraint was don't ask for anything. Uh-huh. Why did you pose that question in that way to the staff? I wanted to hear what the staff saw in the school and I've, I've been around educational institutions my whole life. Both my parents were college professors. Both of them at the end of their careers were at college administrators. So I had learned from both of them, if you really want to know what's going on in a school, 
check out the staff. Mm -hmm. They have a network of knowledge that no one else has, and it's usually more accurate. So I started out with that. Um, and then, um, and what I did was take notes and listen. Um, and then once I got here, I started the same process with the faculty over the fall semester. Mm -hmm. um, and luckily, and I wasn't expecting this, everyone was agreeing with each other. They all saw the same school. I'd never seen anything like this in my life. That's particularly unusual since, you know, the reputation was there was a lot of infighting going on. Well, they had buried whatever hatchets they had. Mm -hmm. um, and But I was also asking them to look aspirationally. You know, what can this be? What do you see? What can this be? Um, and the vision brought folks together. Mm. So that made it a lot easier to begin to think through um, some of the things that I had learned from my mentor at Yale um, as he led the school so well. And perhaps the most important thing he told me time and time again, it's presence. Show up for stuff. You don't even have to say a word. Just be there. Um, the second thing, transparency. You won't like it sometimes, Emily, but always be clear about what you're doing and what your motives are. Now, my mother said a version of this years ago when I first started teaching, when I said, okay, what's, what's the word to the wise mom? And she, without missing a beat, she said, always tell the truth. Mm. And I thought, well, I learned that in Sunday school. And then she said, because they won't believe you and they'll be busy trying to figure out what you're up to and you can get on with your work. Mm -hmm. you, you don't get slowed down. That, 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 to me, that sounds like a real lesson in leadership uh -huh. yeah. and how to be an effective leader. So, so tell me, what goals did you set for the Divinity School given what you had heard from faculty and staff? Um, I wanted us to look seriously at our curriculum. It was dated far too dated. Um, I think the last time it had been looked at closely was 1985. Mm. That's too old yeah. to be a cutting edge school. And, and we knew it. Folks knew it was not the school we could be curricularly. Um, so that was the first thing. How do we refresh ourselves and become relevant again to what our students and prospective students are saying to us they want and need in order to be those effective leaders that will change the world, mm -hmm. um, which is one of our hopes at, 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 at the Divinity School. We want transformation of a society because what we got now is not acceptable. Now, your work focuses on social justice and theology. You wrote a book titled Womanist Ethics and the Cultural Production of Evil, which Jacob J. Erickson says in a 2006 review, quote, is sure and should become a standard for reading in theology and ethics and hopefully pastoral care, end quote. Mm -hmm. You know, in the book, you, you, you engage evil and its cultural dimensions from this womanist perspective. And this really sounds fascinating to me. But let's start with some of our listeners who may not know. What is womanist ethics. <laughs> uh, the simplest way to um, describe it, and I describe it all different kinds of ways each time I'm asked this question, is taking seriously the experiences of black women who are religious, spiritual, whatever you want to call them, but who have this sense of something out there greater than ourselves bringing that into the conversation along with some of the heavyweights of theology and ethics like Bart and Bruner, Cohn, whomever, and recognize that they have, they have a voice, they have a perspective. And one of the ways we do that is to use um, race and class and gender 
and sexuality and sexual orientation and age, all the ways that we exist as people. Mm -hmm. Bring that into the conversation as well, because that's who we are. So we're trying to bring the whole person into um, what we call theology, or what I say in shorthand is God talk. Mm -hmm. Who is God among us, and how are we to respond to God? Um, and so we take those things, um, crafted out of uh, Alice Walker's original definition of womanist, which is in the uh, front piece of her book of essays, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. And then it has the infamous colon. And then she says, womanist prose. And her editor said, what is womanist? And so she came up with this four-part definition. And what it really gets to, uh, the first part is the way knowledge is handed down from older women, older black women, to girls. Mm -hmm. The second part, the communal dimension of how black folk have been and the fact that we are a many colored people for all sorts of reasons. Um, but also we, um, we also have uh, relationships with one another that are both other sex and same sex. And it's been that way for a long time. Mm hmm uh, and then the third part really gets at the beauty of black women that does not fit into the cultural norm of, well, it doesn't really, f the cultural norm of woman as an object or a person uh, doesn't fit most women, no matter what color they may be. But um, she ends that one with love's food and roundness regardless. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth part is the shortest part, which is a critique of feminist theology. Womanist is to feminist as purple is to lavender. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do when I say womanist theology or womanist ethics is to bring the worlds that I grew up with, that the black women in my life, both close to me and tangential to me, and what they taught me about God and the world and what does that mean for us in creating a better world? If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Khalil Ekelona. My guest this hour is Emily Towns, outgoing dean of Vanderbilt's Divinity School. If you have questions or comments for Emily, please tweet us at This Is Nashville. Now, you're from Durham, North Carolina. Yes, and sir. Both of your parents went and were professors at North Carolina Central University, as you, as you mentioned. What did they teach? Uh, they were an interesting pairing. Okay. My mother was a, a molecular biologist uh, and the first black woman to graduate with that degree at the University of Michigan. Okay. My father uh, was in physical education and did ex exercise and movement in the then new field of gerontology. Okay. So we had the phys ed department and the biology department in the house. In the house. Now, was the house, when you grew up, was it a rigorous academic environment? In a very low-key way. Hmm. My sister, who's nine years younger than I am, and I knew we needed to excel at school. But we also wanted to excel at school. So it wasn't hard for us. It wasn't one of those things our parents had to sit us down periodically and say, you know, this isn't acceptable. Um, so I, um, I learned to love learning almost from day one. Mm. Uh, and it was such a gift, such a gift. Did you want to become a teacher like your parents? No, <laughs> I did not. I did not want to do the family business. I was going to be my own person and forge my own pathway. And uh, luckily, when I realized, yeah, I'm supposed to be doing this, neither one of them said, I told you so. Those are good folks right there. Tell me, how, how did you get into theology? College. 
I was casting about for a major. And I'd done the typical thing folks in the 70s did. I had about five or six majors. None of them stuck. Okay. I was looking, looking, looking. I was talking to um, a secretary in the physical sciences collegiate division at my university, University of Chicago. And I was saying to her, I want... I want a major where the questions never end and and you get to ask them and you're not expected to always wrap things up in a neat bow. I, I'm on a quest. And we I paused and we both looked at each other and said, religion. Hmm. So she pulled out the college catalog to see um, if religion was even a major at Chicago. Lo and behold, it was. And the office of the director of that program was literally right next door. Okay. So I went over, um, met him. It was Jonathan Z. Smith, for your listeners who know a little bit about the discipline of history of religions. He was this huge figure in it, I had no idea. I told him what I was interested in. He said, you sound perfect for us. I said, so can you give me an idea of the kinds of courses I should begin to look at? He said, the only thing you have to do is prove that the course relates to religion in some way. And I looked at him and I said, that's everything. He said, precisely. Mm. Go and have fun. And you did. I did. You did. I did. I, and it freaked my friends out in college. Uh, they were like, what is this you're doing? Um, and and it, um, it was probably one of the happiest decisions I ever made in my life. I didn't know where it was going to lead. One place it led you was to education. Like you said. It did. You didn't want to become a teacher like your parents. So how did that happen? How did you end up in front of a classroom? Well, I uh, ended up uh, going to the University of Chicago Divinity School. I stayed home. I had taken some classes in the Divinity School as an undergrad, so I kind of knew the place. I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, And at that time, the first professional degree they had was the Doctor of Ministry. That has since changed. Um, It's now a completely different degree. Um, But I graduated with a doctor of ministry degree. Um, And with that degree at that time, I had to do a series of qualifying exams and a dissertation, all a little less than the Ph.D. program. Okay. Um, After I graduated, I was um, busy running a uh, branch of a theological bookstore, the Seminary Co-op Bookstore, um, in the Chicago area. And Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary had its first influx of black women seeking ordination. And they were a mouthy bunch. (laughs) And they went to the administration and complained, there are no black women on your faculty. We need a black woman on your faculty. The administration looked around, saw that I had enough qualifications with a doctor of ministry, uh, asked me to come in and teach a class on uh, black women in the church. I said, sure. Sounded like fun. And... um, So I worked with a couple of the faculty members to develop the class. We got it where we all were happy with. I was on my way to the first day of the class, driving up Lakeshore Drive in Chicago to Evanston, and realized I didn't know the first thing about teaching. I thought. And I, I, I can't turn around. I got to go. So I drove the rest of the way uh, in very deep and fervent prayer (laughs) to get me through this. So what happened when you showed up at class? I walked in the door, um, about 25 or so students. 
almost all of them were black women, a few black men, a couple of white women, and they were just a buzz. They were so happy. They were so excited. It. I found out later, absolutely none of them had ever had a black woman professor. Mm. So this was all going to be new to them. And I um, have a ritual that I started then, which is put my stuff down, arrange it, look at the class, and then say, let us pray. They thought I was praying for them. I was praying for me. <laughs> but it worked out. <laughs> yes, it did. And I looked up after the prayer, opened my mouth, started talking, and within seconds knew this is what I'm supposed to do. Mm. It was the most profound experience of a call I have ever had, even more so than ordination. What was that feeling like when you realized this was a call? I'm supposed to be doing this. Um, I can't say the word, so I will substitute it. I thought and felt, oh, shoot. Okay. This means I have to go back to school <laughs> to get a Ph.D., if this is what I'm supposed to do, because at this point, a doctor of ministry degree is not enough to do full-time teaching. So I, I did it. <laughs> you went back to school to get your Ph.D. and subsequently moved on to Yale and... Um, let yourself hear. I want to talk about that a little bit later. We have to, but now we have to kind of take a short break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with theologian Emily Towns, outgoing dean of Vanderbilt's Divinity School. If you've been a student of the Divinity School and you want to share a story about your experience or a question for Emily, tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. I'm Khalil Colonna, and this is Nashville. We've been talking this hour with Dr. Emily Towns. She's been the dean at Vanderbilt's Divinity School for the past decade. Under her stewardship, the school has enhanced its curriculum, added new concentrations for master's programs, and established the James Lawson Institute for Research and Study of Nonviolent Moments. Dr. Dean Towns, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. Now, let me, I got to ask you this. You describe Vanderbilt's Divinity School as a unicorn. Why is that? Well, we, uh, if you look internally into the uh, university, we have historically been a little left of center mm -hmm. to the rest of the school. Um, but in a way, uh, sometimes in very hard ways, but um, of late in very collegial ways, but still um, a, a, a tad left-leaning and unapologetically so because we think that's what justice-making is all about, not supporting the status quo, but trying to guide us all into the, the marvelous what-if mm we did this thing right with one another and with the rest of creation. Uh, so we're unusual. We're unusual in the university. We're unusual uh, for a school of the South, frankly. Um, to take that stance, unapologetically so, um, but also seeking partners. I mean, we have good relationships with our peer schools, um, last I heard, um, and and um, I think try to respect everybody's doing what they do, given some of them are in um, denominations that are really having a rough time like now, like the United Methodists, um, and some of them are in uh, denominations where we might, if we had affiliated with a denomination, might be us, like the United Church of Christ. But we're not those things. We are staunchly non-denominational. 
because we want to be able to welcome all people. And the Divinity School has really stood out since 1875 during its inception, and it's known for progressive stances on race and gender, among other things. Tell me, how did that evolve in the early years, like predating your tenure there? Well, uh, I can't say our early, early deans were models of uh, who we have become. Mm. Uh, many of them, well, at least two or three of them were... Um, slavery sympathizers. Uh, as we get into the early 1900s, some of them, at least one of them, um, publicly supported the myth of the black rapist. Um, and it wasn't until really the 20s and 30s um, where the two of our professors, whose names are escaping me right now, um, took on the agrarian movement and started training and shaping the um, young men, mostly, um, who were members of the student body to go out and be a part of agra agrarian reform movement. So this is early labor, mm -hmm. uh, which is not popular in the South and still isn't. Um, and we started to grow from that, I think. So by the time the 1950s rolled around, the faculty had really primed its own pump and looked around and said, you know, this university um, is awfully, awfully white. And there's a whole world of black folk right outside our door that we're not reaching out to. And so the faculty voted to admit the first black student in the university in 1954, uh, Bishop Joseph Johnson. Bishop Johnson went on to be a, um, a bishop in the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. And then Johnson doubled down and got a PhD and became the first black PhD student of the university in New Testament studies. So this is, we're in the 50s now. And in 1958, James Lawson came to the Divinity School, and uh, that is um, where the, the sit-in movement came home to the Divinity School. And, and for listeners who don't know, Reverend James Lawson was a very prominent civil rights leader here in Nashville. He played a key role in the sit-in movements pushing to desegregate our lunch counters. And yeah. Please continue, Dean. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the executive committee of our board of trust did not like Lawson's activities and um, told the president he needs to be expelled. The president told the dean, you have to expel him. The dean refused. So the chancellor had to do it. Um, and it was at that point many members of the faculty resigned in protest mm. And a few folks from across the university. Um, one thing led to another. A compromise was broached. He was invited back. Um, he was already uh, in school at uh, Boston University School of Theology. He said, I'm fine. I'll just stay here. I bear you no malice. Um, but what that started with internal to the divinity school um, was a really serious conversation, not only with the faculty, but with the students in terms of what is it we stand for? What is it do we believe? How do we live out our faith? How do we, we be true to our call? Um, and that has been the question for the faculty and the student body. Since, since that time. Since that time. is Who are we? Our, our motto is scola profitarum. You can't get more challenging than to call yourself the school of the prophets. Mm. I mean, really. <laughs> That's quite a task. That is a task. And we double down. If you uh, walk into the main atrium of the Divinity School, you've got a... Uh, a water fountain that has scola propitarum chiseled into it. And if you come in the other way, the original limple 
uh, of the Divinity School, Scola Profitarum, is wedged into the wall. So you get us coming and going no matter <laughs> which way you go. I, I think about that every time I walk into the building. When I, it doesn't matter which side I come in on. Mm-hmm. It's a reminder. You know, to honor the legacy, uh, you launched the James Lawson Institute of for the Research and Study of Nonviolent Movements in mm-hmm. partnership with the College of Arts and Sciences. And you said, you know, you don't forget these these charges that are there. Here you launched this program to honor this man and his work. What does the institution hope to accomplish? I was in a very interesting conversation recently um, with some younger scholars who were um, in some ways dismissing nonviolent social change. Hmm. I found that troubling and short-sighted and probably a product of youth and age. I will own up to that. And I, I posed a question. I said, tell me what violent act has crafted structural, permanent social change by black folk. Well, you know, they just lit into me like white on rice. I was uh, practicing respectability pro- pro- uh, politics, politics. Mm-hmm. and I thought I'm not going to have this. I'm not going to have this conversation right now, because anytime I hear somebody launch the charge respectability project uh, politics, it often means they don't have an answer to the question I just posed. And I'm not here to win points. I'm here for a conversation, and we're not going to have a conversation at this point. So what I'm hoping that the Institute is able to do is help students in this generation figure out what nonviolent social change looks like in this era. It may not be sit-ins. It may not be a whole bunch of things it was in the 60s. Um, But let's figure out what it is. Uh, Because, frankly, we're outnumbered. Mm -hmm. So we have to be strategic. Um, And we have to understand that part of why we do this is because we're trying to make the world a better place. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Kali Olekalona. My guest this hour is Dr. Emily Towns, the outgoing dean of Vanderbilt Divinity School. Join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. Now, practice is a vital part of the mission and its curriculum. Mm-hmm. Why? It's not a very good thing to have a lot of ideas that aren't grounded in reality. Mm-hmm. Uh, Now, I love playing with ideas as much as the next person. It's what I do for a living, often in classrooms. I'm constantly prodding students to think deeper, think more creatively, do this, do that. But at the end of the day, the old preacher in me, the old minister in me, and the old grumpy ethicist in me says, you got to come up with something that makes sense and can change the world. Maybe not the whole world, maybe just your little part of it. I'm not asking for um, global uh, solutions, but where we are, where we're planted, how do we put into practice what we're learning Mm. so that it is a resource as opposed to um, simple ideology? I'm hoping um, that resources can help us develop strategies and strategies can get us out of this mess. You know, some people see our environment right now here in Nashville, the state, as a divided place. Mm -hmm. When you look, what do you see? Same thing. Mm. Hurts my heart. But... um, we are, we don't even know each other. We don't listen to each other. 
And we often don't care about each other. And that's no way to run a democracy. In fact, you can't have a democracy doing that kind of stuff. Well, what role do you see the Divinity School in playing in addressing that? Addressing that, bringing us together, getting us to know yeah, one another. Yeah, we're trying to um, help students understand sometimes it's better to listen than to keep talking. Um, to understand that there are a variety of viewpoints. It's okay to listen to them. You don't have to agree with them, but at least listen to why somebody is saying what they're saying. Now, if they're not saying anything at all, you don't have to listen to that. Mm -hmm. But I'm a firm believer. You just never know when the Holy Spirit's going to break out mm -hmm. and where God's going to show up and from whose lips. So probably best to hold self-righteousness at bay and be present with folk. Um, so. So tell me this. What's next for you? Like, what are you looking forward to? I'm looking forward to a year-long research leave, which will probably be nothing more than reading all the stuff I didn't have time to read <laughs> yeah. over the last 10-plus years uh, to get myself caught up with... Um, some of the dynamic new um, thinkers in the academy whom I hear doing papers but haven't had a chance to read their books or even their articles sometimes. But mostly, um, I'm also looking forward to being back in the classroom full time. Mm. That really is my first love. And I didn't realize how much I missed it until I had a near experience last fall of what I had the first time I walked in the classroom when I was teaching um, one of our sections for senior seminar that helps students get ready to write the big senior paper. Mm -hmm. And so I had about 11 students in class, and I had been teaching mostly at this point um, uh, reading courses, so no more than two or three people. Sometimes it might balloon up to five. Um, and when I walked into that classroom, I didn't know any of the students, really. I opened my mouth and I went, oh, this is why I have done what I have done. And I miss it. Mm. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm rusty. Like riding a bike. Yeah, uh, it, it is, but you got to ride it first. And so <laughs> I'm going to have to continue to um, get those wheels moving. But I'm looking forward to that. Speaking of students, we got a tweet from PhD student Ristina Gooden. She writes, quote, listening to my forever dean, Dr. Emily Towns, hearing her tell her story reminds me that we have to let life live and God do their thing. The path forward will make itself well known, end quote. Dean Towns, what's your response to that? Thank you, Ristina. <laughs> no, she, she's, she's close to a ride or die student for me. Mm. Um, if you don't take time to listen to where you're being asked to go, you're going to end up in some strange places and um, and places that probably aren't productive and may even be deadly, not only for yourself, but for others. Um, so I, I agree with her. Got to do it. I got about maybe 30 seconds left. What do you want people here in Nashville and Middle Tennessee to know, to, to keep in mind and in spirit? as we collectively face the future? This charge I give to, gave to the um, graduating class this year, which I do every year, but this year I ended it with a charge to live your life with joy. Mm. If you can do that, genuine joy, um, you'd be amazed at what could break out. 
Dr. Emily Towns is the outgoing dean of Vanderbilt's Divinity School. Dr. Towns, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. I really appreciate this. Oh, you're welcome, Khalil. And thank you for tuning in this hour. This is Nashville as a production of WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. Today's episode was produced by our executive producer, Andrea Tutto. Our senior producer is Steve Harouche. Our digital lead is Anna Gallegos Cannon. And Michaela Elias is our technical director. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. Special thanks to Victoria Dorward. Listen back at This Is Nashville or wherever you get your podcasts. The conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This Is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelona. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be good to each other.